planet should not be called Earth. It should be called Ocean. Our food, our climate, the air we breathe all depend on the sea. Today, overfishing and climate change are problems that can seem too big to fix. But the underwater world has a unique ability to bounce back. In just one generation, the ocean could once again be full of life. Find out what it will take to protect a third of all waters on our planet. See how scientists, communities, and leaders are working together to create protective places that can sustain people and nature. And do your part to support the great recovery of ocean life. This is 30 by 30, a planet-wide mission to protect 30% of the ocean by 2030. Hi everyone, and selamat datang. My name is Sun Ho, and I'm with Climate Governance Malaysia, the second climate governance country chapter, and the first in Asia set up under the auspices of the World Economic Forum. We are part of a global movement to address the climate emergency, which has evidently become more urgent. Some of you would have participated in our past webinars and we'll be aware that our focus is to raise awareness of and encourage calls to action by the private sector and similar stakeholders. Having said that, we do recognize that the important work is really done on the ground by NGOs and communities, likely the ones who are most affected by the consequences of climate change. Today, we'll feature three of them. You will hear their stories their efforts and their call for support. To moderate today's event and introduce the panelists to you is Florence Tan. Florence is the Corporate Responsibility Lead at PwC Malaysia. PwC itself has set a net zero target by 2030. Over to you, Florence. Thank you, Sun Ho. Thank you for setting the context for today's panel and a very kind introduction. I don't know about you, but I truly enjoyed the video just now. It was brilliant. Thank you. It certainly sets the right tone for the conversation that we'll have later. And greetings to everyone on the call, no matter where you're dialing in from. Thank you for joining us for today's panel on Life Underwater. We have with us today three nonprofits whose work focuses on conserving life underwater and working with and building the community around them. We will see through their eyes how people's lives have changed because of climate change, development, and even ecotourism. I can't wait for you to listen to their sharing. It's both informative and inspiring. So I'd like to uh, go through the flow with you. First, we'll have presentations from all three nonprofits, starting with Julian Hyde of Reef Check, followed by Noor Afika Sawood from Club Alami, and Dr. Chen Pelfniok from Turtle Conservation Society. They will have a 15-minute presentation each, then we'll have question time. Now, during the presentations, you can log your questions in the Q&A section at the bottom row. You'll see a little small button that says Q&A, just click on that and I'll compile the questions for the panelists. So uh, without uh, delaying this any further, I'd like to invite Julian Hyde of Reef, Reef Check uh, and a quick introduction first. Julian is a scientist by training with a degree in biochemistry. He moved to KL in 1998 to head up an environmental consulting company before moving to Tioman Island to pursue his dream of running his own dive center, which he did for six years. It was during that time that he was interested in reef check, 
which he helped set up in 2007. Now, 14 years later, ReefCheck now has a national coral reef survey program and field offices in three sites. One of these sites, Julian will share about their work on Pulau Mantanani. Over to you, Julian. Uh, thank you, Florence. Let me um, see if I can load this thing up. Okay, <clears throat> so this is a, <clears throat> a drone shot of uh, Kampung Padang on uh, Pulau Mantanani, one of the sites that uh, ReefCheck works at. Um, I'm talking about Mantanani, but I'm really talking about all of us. Um, for those of you who don't know where it is, this is uh, uh, where Mantanani is, a little dot out in the South China Sea. Uh, we talk about Mantanani, but actually it's uh, three islands, um, Mantanani Bissau, Mantanani Kachil, and a little rock called Lingisan. Um, there's a local population of about a thousand people living on the island, Bajau Ubian, uh, in uh, two villages. Uh, until the last few years, it's been a fairly traditional fishing community. Um, here's what you see when you arrive at Mantanani. Um, blue sea, white sand, green trees. You can see why tourists love it. I wish I was there right now instead of dismal KL. Um, a typical picture, tropical picture postcard, tropical paradise. Uh, above water and below. Uh, the water's clear. There's some very pretty reefs. Um, for those of you who are not familiar with coral reefs, um, this is what a reef should look like. There's lots of color. There's lots of movement that's bursting with ecological and economic value. Um, intact reefs like this have many different habitats or ecological niches, niches that support a wide diversity of life on a coral reef, not to mention providing uh, a whole bunch of what we call ecosystem services, benefits to community, foods, jobs, shoreline protection against waves and storms and so on. <clears throat> Until you disturb it. This is what we found when we first visited Mantanani. Uh, this is the result of widespread fish bombing. The reef is reduced to rubble. All those habitats have gone, uh, along with all the wildlife that used to live there, stuff that we used to eat, um, not to mention the other ecosystem services that healthy reefs provide. Fish bombing is illegal in Malaysia, of course, but unfortunately it's quite, still quite common in some areas of Sabah. Um, <laughs> it makes catching very easy because once the bomb goes off, the stunned fish either float to the surface or sink to the bottom. All you have to do is collect them. Uh, but the bombing is indiscriminate. It kills the fish you want to eat and also those that you don't want. You just leave behind what you don't want like these guys did. This is a picture of a bombed reef. Uh, you can see clearly the discarded fish um, and you can see the damaged, destroyed coral reef around it. Once bombed, this ecosystem loses all productivity. There's no fish, so there's no food. Uh, tourists don't want to come and see it. So it's a lose-lose for everybody. And like I said, sadly, this is happening in Mantanani, as is rampant growth in tourism. Um, as many as 3,000 day trips visitors uh, before the pandemic. Uh, this has become a, a common site now, multiple boats at snorkeling sites, hundreds of snorkels in the water, few of them with anything like decent skills. Um, so it's largely unregulated tourism. No one's stopping the tourists doing bad stuff because, well, they're tourists, right? They need their money. And I've experienced this all around Malaysia, all around South, Southeast Asia. It gets worse. The beaches are often covered in trash brought, a, brought ashore by the wind and the waves. Um, yes, some comes from the village. Uh, everybody blames the locals, but we've done a waste audit and clearly there is other waste coming from far afield, including the Philippines and Vietnam. So it's not just the locals. It's a bigger problem. It's a wider problem. <clears throat> But I hope you still have that picture of a tropical paradise in mind because it is, it still is. I'll put the sound off. This is a video that a colleague sent me just, just in the last couple of days, literally. This is what it looks like at its best. Um, but the people living on the island have a number of challenges they face on a daily basis. Uh, the groundwater is contaminated because of excess extraction. So they have to drink bottled water, hence all of the bottles on the beaches. Uh, the generator only runs from six o'clock in the evening till six o'clock in the morning, if it runs at all. So there's no refrigeration and there are problems keeping food fresh, not to mention charging your handphone battery in the middle of the day, should you need to. There are no medical facilities on the island. Break a leg, 
and our journey back to the mainland, assuming a boat can make it, and to the hospital. So very few facilities on the island. There's no waste management, there's no sewage treatment. All of these things are very, very primitive. Uh, this not to mention even the cultural impacts of tourism. Uh, the villagers don't really like all those tourists tramping through their village. It's like a living zoo. Um, and then we get on to bigger impacts like climate change and storms. How many of us face such problems in our lives in a comfortable condo in Kale? I ask myself sometimes. Have you ever bought, thought about whether or not we'll face these challenges in the future? Who, 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 who would have thought about, who could have expected COVID? So, Mantanani, remote, beautiful, lacking in basic services with a declining fishery and growing tourism impacts, not to mention climate change impacts. How do we start to address these challenges on Mantanani? Well, meet Budi. Budi is a resident of Mantanani, born and bred. Uh, he's lived there all his life. He used to be one of the bad guys. He used to be a, a fish bomber. Uh, but a few years ago, back in 2014, he came to work, work with us. Um, frankly, because we could provide him a higher guaranteed income. He wasn't a, an eco-convert, at least not immediately. But slowly over time, he came to understand the issues that we were dealing with just by working with our team on the island, asking questions, watching what they were doing. Um, <clears throat> initially, he helped us with our coral restoration programs. No, no, we weren't trying to fix the damaged reefs. There's too much damage. It's impossible to fix it. But we wanted to engage the villagers in a conversation, sort of, why are you doing this? And we would say, because the reef is damaged and there's no fish, you're losing your fish, right? And so you can start a dialogue uh, on, on marine conservation issues. Uh, Booty also helped with the early stages of waste management, uh, collecting some of the plastic bottles from the beach. Again, not really trying to fix the waste management problem at that time, but to start a dialogue with the locals about some of the problems that they're facing. <clears throat> And this is how we started. First, identify their challenges. And I think my colleagues will echo this this afternoon. Uh, help them to resolve those problems. Build trust by being there consistently. Uh, even though some of the community, community members didn't really like it. And Booty was an important link with the community, with the villagers, because no one likes to be told what to do by an outsider. But when it comes from one of their own community, the tone of the message, the type of the message, the acceptability of the message becomes much stronger. Since this early start, we've uh, grown uh, the program into more of a community development program. We're working on capacity building. This is a first aid course for uh, snorkeling guides so that more local islanders can earn a better living from snorkel guiding and tourism, for example. We're improving the waste management, collecting trash from the village now on a daily basis. How did a coral reef NGO get involved in waste management? Well, nobody else was doing it. So we send it to the mainland, recycle what we can. Uh, this is Faisal and Hamizi. This is two members of the local community in the recycling center that we've set up. They now work with us managing the waste, but also working in the, the new community-based tourism projects we're working on and the agriculture projects. Over time, we started to engage the local community on issues about how to protect the island's marine ecosystems, because at the end of the day, that's how they all make their living and how they get a large portion of their food. This started in 2016 with the first community consultations, which ended in 2017 with the first management plan for the island. This was basically written by the locals, probably one of the first such plans in, uh, in Malaysia. And we're still working with several parks on the gazette into the marine protected area around the islands, hopefully by the end of this year or early next year. Same time, we're working on economic development projects, uh, uh, community-based tourism, agriculture, and so on. Um, so that we're able to take or give provide alternatives to just working in tourism so it's a nice island it's got some good resources it's got some willing people we've got some economic development going on so what's the problem well this picture was taken in october last year once we got the aquaculture uh, underway this is the same place in january 2021 after three weeks of rain flooded most of the island including the village um, which was basically underwater. Uh, most of the island is the first time they've experienced anything like this. There was damage to the village, the infrastructure to the buildings, the crops were gone, significant economic losses, perhaps a, an indication of the damage that climate change can do. Um, we've got plenty of external indicators. Uh, this is a satellite image from the middle of 2020, showing sea surface temperatures around Southeast Asia. 
and the sea surface temperature reflects the likelihood of coral bleaching, which is one of our main concerns. Um, the, the yellow is warm enough to bleach, the orange is bleaching, and the red is dying coral. And you can see that the waters around Malaysia are surrounded by that. So it's a real problem and it's happening all around us. What have we got? We've got floods in the island, uh, economic losses in agriculture and village infrastructure. We've got bigger storms, recent weather events have destroyed jetties, more economic losses. We've got COVID, less tourism, more economic losses. And now we're back to the old ways of fishing because there's no tourism, which means further damage to ecosystems and more economic losses. Does the village have to look after this themselves? Do they have the resources, the skills, the adaptive capacity? How, how can we help with these problems? Um, on a micro scale, but lest you forget, this is not some story from a distant land. This is happening on your doorstep. You can't just say, this doesn't affect me. This is closer than that. This is Mantanani. And I hate to sound apocalyptic, but it's getting worse. The st storms are getting stronger. Wildfires are getting worse. Oceans are still warming. That's the story from the island. What are we doing about it? Well, uh, we've got 18, 17, 18 staff, most of whom are based on islands uh, like Mantanani, but uh, not just Mantanani, we're working in Palatia and we're working in Johor. Uh, we have a number of programs we run. The core of it is a reef survey. We cover 200 sites around Malaysia, collecting data for managers, helping to improve resource management. Uh, we do some science on coral reef restoration, on uh, bleaching and resilience. But we also work with communities, as I've said, doing awareness and education, looking at economic development opportunities so that we can help them to diversify alternative, uh, diversify livelihoods, for example. I'm sure everybody's familiar with this picture, the 17 uh, sustainable development goals. But I think the point of my talk today is that being familiar is not enough. Uh, we need everybody to start taking this seriously, taking the SDGs seriously, sustainability, taking climate change seriously. So what are you doing as an individual or corporation? Well, this is what we do. One small NGO, one willing community is addressing all of these issues. It's not just about life below water. It's about poverty. It's about hunger. It's about decent work. So what's the corporate world doing? Um, how are you helping? And I don't just mean go fund an NGO. That's just the philanthropic part of it. But what are you doing to support our efforts in your own business to make it sustainable? Changing pa plastic packaging. Unilever is now using recycled PET for its uh, detergent bottles. That's a small change, not difficult to make. What about strategically? Where's your business going to be in five years time, 10 years time? Are you looking into sustainability? Because if you're not, um, your business is in trouble. Your investors are going to start picking on you. Look at what happened with Top Glove and, and BlackRock recently, which forced changes in the board because of bad decisions made during uh, the, the pandemic. So it's not just internal stuff now. What investments are you proposing over the next years? Because if you're still thinking of investing in large infrastructure projects in biodiverse, fragile environments, islands, rainforests, then you need to rethink that because your investors certainly are thinking. So what are you doing as a, as a company, as an organization to protect biodiversity and minimize your climate impact? Because at the end of the day, we all live in that village on Mentanadi. We all live in a global village and we all need to play our role in helping it to prospect. I look forward to taking questions later on. Thank you very much. Thank you, Julian. Pulau Mantanani is beautiful. And thank you for sharing the very real everyday lives of the people on the island and also the challenges they face and how much climate change affects them on a very real basis and how much, uh, how close they are to poverty. And, and having no livelihood. Um, I really like your ideas about how companies can minimize the impact on, a, on their environment, and hopefully we'll have a, a better discussion around this later. Next, we'll have uh, Nor Afrika Saud of Club Alami, a little bit on uh, Afrika. She is just 23 years old, and she was in accounting stream in secondary school and pursued economy, economic and finance in university. She doesn't have a science background in school, but she practices science uh, daily uh, as a science citizen. And uh, still run, waters run deep. Uh, you'll see what I mean later. She was a reserve officer uh, in a training unit during her undergraduate days, and she can handle many types of weapon. So over to you, Afika. Okay. 
Uh, thank you to Florence and Climate Governance Malaysia for this opportunity. Okay. Hi everyone, I'm from Club Alami and this is what we do. We empowering a community to save our seas and our stuff. I'm Afika, I'm 23 and I am Club Alami Manager. So this is my story. I joined club when I was 13 years old. I was very shy back then and always hide behind my sister. Kala Alami teach us to, uh, sorry, Kala Alami uh, give me opportunities to learn science and to conduct real research, things I could not learn in school. Because of what I learned in club Alami, I become a research assistant. I be a research assistant for Dr. Hazel and I help PhD student in zooplankton research. Many people think that as Budak Kampu, we don't know much. But in 2017, I have presented a paper on uh, community use of seagrass at international conference at UPM. Actually, as Budak Kampu, we can do anything. And Kela Alami uh, teach us to work using our brains. We learn how to open our eyes and to observe the change that happened in our neighborhood. Kela Alami has 40 kids. And we have a lot of activities, events where we learn about science and the environment. We also went for the trip and, many, and meet many people. Abalan is our boss and Kaina is our co-founder. And look at Kimi, he was very small then. He is nine years old. Later on, I will show you what is Kimi doing now. We are in Satwest Johor. In Mukim Tanjung Kupang, we have nine villages. Currently, Club Alami HQ is in Kampung Ladang. This is what our kampung used to look like. All of us are depend on the sea. The person who are standing is Abalan's grandfather. All of them are fishermen. Even though we are, even though uh, there is development everywhere, our seas are still alive. We still have seahorse, dugong, turtles that feed on our seagrass. We have uh, endemic mangrove species that only can be found at our area. Our seagrass area is the largest intertidal seagrass meadow at Peninsula Malaysia. It's about two kilometers long. We need to do everything we can to protect this special habitat. Uh, uh, at Club Alami, we are so lucky. We go to the sea for our environmental education. This I couldn't get at school. And look at Shafi. He teach uh, other kids about what he have learned even though he was still a kid. Shafiq started joining club when he was uh, 10 years old and now he is pre-university student. We also learned how to do a research. This is so interesting because I can go to the sea. I can learn a lot of new things that I never knew before. Even though my uh, relative is fisherman, I never went to the sea before. I saw the sea star for the first time. This is really special to me. And from here, I had enough knowledge to work as a research assistant for Dr. Hazel in UTHM. We also uh, learned to be a nature guide. The best part is we can show to many people that we have this special habitat. Before this, we don't know this habitat is special. After we know, we would like to share to people to make them realize we have this kind of special habitat. But suddenly, all that changed in 2014. Development started in our waters. At this time, we don't know everything about the development. Even though fishermen and also community doesn't know about this until we went out to check. Then we went out to check. We saw the silk curtain. The silk curtain is in the yellow color. Actually, the silk curtain is to prevent the sun from going straight away to the seagrass area. But they didn't do it in the right way. They didn't care. So the silk curtain is not effective. The sand still goes to the seagrass area. When the seagrass is covered by the sand, our habitat got impacted. Our fishermen livelihood got impacted. So uh, this is not because only one uh, development. In our area, we have many development. And we also have effect on our, on our land. Suddenly we have flooded. Two weeks before Raya, during fasting month, everything was damaged. All of our preparation for Raya also damaged. So this has never happened in the past. So why is it happening now? I would say it because of the climate change. It because of the rising sea levels. 
it because of they clear the hills and also this is because of the development and i mentioned it again it's not only because of one development we have many development all around us after that kaina said they wanted to stop club alami actually kaina and ambalan doesn't have more money to continue they were tired we kids also have big exam some of us have finished schools and get getting started to work but suddenly uh, developers come to us for which is for city Forest City said they want to support us. So we restarted again Club Alami with the Forest City support. Abalan said we need to do not only just education. So we came up with this new objective because uh, under Abalan's vision, because of our habitat got impact, fishermen bring less catch. So we decided to focus on community capacity building. And uh, from here, we can uh, ensure that community can benefit and uh, can get income from the development all around us. To do everything is not easy. All of us are so stressed. Abalan and Kaina not only stress to looking money to pay us and for our activities, but Abalan need to uh, handle with the villagers, political issues, and also fishermen. Handle with our attitude and uh, our problem. Actually, Kaina has another job in Singapore. We as a crew also stress because we need to learn a lot of new things. So this is quite challenging to us to continue. But then uh, we set up this Pasar Pendekal Laut. Uh, before this, uh, fishermen bring their cash to the middleman. Then they only got 8 ringgit to 15 ringgit per kilogram of crab. And now, Abang Lan pay them 15 ringgit to 30, kilo, uh, to 30 ringgit per kilogram of crab. So fishermen got doubles and now fishermen bring less cash. So uh, we pay them more and we sell five ringgit highest to the customer. We also educate customer to value fishermen hard work and skill. Then we also set up uh, this war room uh, to, to improve the community income. Actually, this uh, objective of the war room is to do showcase and preserve kampung cooking style. So from here, uh, in this way, we can encourage more people to buy more seafood uh, at the pasar and bring it to the warung so they can cook with the traditional style. In this way, we can uh, improve the, the seafood sales and the local women also can earn more money when they cooking at the warung. Ecotourism is another way to bring income to the community. So we combine the locals and scientific knowledge in our content. So uh, visitors can have very unique information when they come to us. And uh, remember, I introduced you to Kimi earlier, the little boy with the black shirt. Kimi is 19 years old now. He is in the red shirt. Actually, Kimi is our uh, leader for research, for uh, cultural heritage research. And Kimi have licensed nature guide. And who is sitting on the left is Irfan. Irfan started joining club when he was 12 years old. And Ifan is club alami manager. He also have licensed nature guide. It's really interesting. Remember Shafiq, uh, uh, the little kid in the yellow shirt who teaching uh, the other kids? Shafiq still love to teach. He teach a uh, local kid every Saturday in the clubhouse. He teach about the environmental education. Shafiq would like to pass his knowledge to the young generation. So we also do the research. We do research about the seagrass, mangrove, otters, uh, seahorse, and also dugong. This photo is from our dugong, uh, dugong research. We do the research about the dugong population, habitat, and also feeding trails. We also learn to do uh, the GIS mapping, which is a geographical information system with the Dr. Gillian and Dr. Effendi from the University Malaya. So our research is under theirs and Kaina supervision. This is our first book. We also do the cultural heritage research. This book is written by us and Kaina. The illustration is drawn by Haikal and Alif. Haikal and Alif is a club alami artist. They is very creative. So we would like to produce five more books about uh, on our habitat. So we will succeed somehow. But then in 2020, the virus is come. 
people cannot travel to the villages to buy the fish. So the first thing that we need to do is to save the fishermen income. So the, we did the big fish bailout. We did online sales and delivery. So we raised funds to buy the big fish and send it to uh, poor and homeless people. So we already saved 80,000 ringgit for more than fishermen. It's really quite a huge number. During this pandemic, we have no tourists. So we lost a lot of money. Before this, our, uh, our income is come from the tourism. From this income, we support our initiative program and our education. But now we have loss of income. So we decided to set up the Alami Academy. Uh, we already registered this Alami Academy. From this Alami Academy, we'll generate a sustained income to support the community initiatives and community education. So we need your help to make this Alami Academy be real. We need to continue teaching the Kampong kids, students, Iskandar youth strangers about this habitat. We need to pass this knowledge to the young generation. This is the paper that I, that I presented on the international conference. When you look at, at this map, you can see the dot. The dot is showing you the uh, where fishermen catch their fish. So actually, every inch of the sea is very valuable to the fishermen. So in the future, uh, our, our sea will be the land. And uh, maybe one day fishermen cannot enter again to the sea. Then nelayan sendiri cakap, yang dia rasa laut dah semakin kecil. Fishermen always said that they feel our sea getting smaller. They feel endangered. And yes, our fishermen are endangered. So we need your help to save our pendeka laut. Because we really need our pendeka laut. We are so close to our dream. Our club Na Alami Nature and Heritage Center is supported by the locals and private agency. This will be our new home where we have the activities. And fishermen also can use this uh, place to make the net and uh, to attract more tourists. So this will be our commercial center. But we need your help to complete this building to make our dream become true. This is how you can help us. You can help us to complete this building or you can help us to make Alami Academy be real. Work with us for us to do corporate training, to do uh, undergraduate and postgraduate education. From this, we can generate more income. Or else you also can support our environmental education program for our kampong kids. So this is us when we started Joint Club for many years ago. We were so young then. But now we are older. We are Club Alami. We will take over everything one day. I will be head of Alami Academy. Irfan will be head of tourism. Shafiq will be head of education. We will succeed somehow. But we hope for your support to make it possible. Thank you for listening. And please, please check out our website and do follow our social media. Thank you so much. Thank you, Afika. That was such an inspiring presentation. You and the team, you faced so many challenges from sustaining the club to local development to COVID-19, but you came up with so many innovative solutions. Well done to you and the team. And I can see how Club Alami is so important uh, from research to growing the local community. I love the story around uh, engaging children and making and empowering them uh, and how you profile fishermen skills and through cooking and improving income generation. And also do let us know when the books are ready and how we can buy them. Uh, last but not least is Dr. Chen Pelfniok and she is from the Turtle Conservation Society. Pelf wears many hats. She's a freshwater turtle researcher and conservationist turned entrepreneur. She has also been working with the local communities in Traganu to protect and conserve critically endangered river terrapins in the past 17 years. She has conducted numerous programs with school students as well as nature trips for the public. She was recently named the Commonwealth Point of Light for Malaysia from Her Majesty Queen Elizabeth II for her little conservation efforts. Well done to you, Pelf. Uh, 
she's she is a very busy woman, but what she does to sustain this this uh momentum is to guard her reading and jogging time fiercely. So she makes it a point to jog for at least twenty minutes every day and reads before bed. Now over to you, Pell. Okay, thanks for the introduction, Florence. Um, hello and good evening. My name is Pell and I co-founded Turtle Conservation Society of Malaysia in 2011. So 11 years ago, I came to Kemaman in Trunganu to look for the critically endangered river terrapins. By then, I had been involved in turtle conservation for about six years and uh, I wanted to find where else we could find these rare creatures. So you see, they are listed as one of the top 25 most critically endangered freshwater turtles in the whole world. And they are only found in three countries, uh, Thailand, Cambodia, and Peninsula Malaysia. They are not even found on Borneo Island. So the terrapins are threatened by uh, chronic consumption of their eggs. For decades, local villagers have been collecting and consuming their eggs with little to no recruitment back into the river. They are also threatened by the use of indiscriminate fishing gear. Uh, if left unchecked for prolonged periods, this fishing gear, the terrapins that are caught in this fishing gear will drown. Uh, the construction of uh, dams and sand mining operations in the river destroy their feeding and nesting habitats. So river terrapins play really critical roles in the environment. <clears throat> they help keep our rivers clean by feeding on dead animal materials. Uh, they are excellent seed dispersers. So when they feed on mangroves, fruits, and then defecate in the river, they help plant mangroves in the river. And in the natural environment, terrapin eggs provide nutrients to other wildlife as well, such as uh, wild boars and monitor lizards. So my first project took me to 35 rural uh, communities in the state of Trunganu. And one of the villages that I visited was called Kampung Pasir Gajah or Pasir Gajah village. I had earlier communicated with the chief of the village and uh, he had helped me gather a few uh, men who regularly spend time in the river. So please recall that this was a uh, pre WhatsApp and there was no send location in my phone. So, but when I stepped into the village for the first time, um, I became aware that I was the outsider. I realized that I needed to thread very carefully because I wanted to give these local folks uh, a good impression of myself as well as the project I was going to pitch. So after exchanging greetings, uh, I asked them about the terrapins and then whether they knew anything about them. And uh, they very proudly admitted that uh, they've been consuming these terrapin eggs. And then I asked whether they have seen a decline in the number of terrapins and the eggs. And they were surprised I knew about it. And then they started telling me how these terrapins used to be so abundant. But then um, in the past few years, it had been very scarce. So I told them what I knew from my previous research and uh, I also told them about our intention to work with the local communities to, hide, uh, to help save terrapins from being uh, eaten to, to extinction. And then I asked whether they would consider partnering with our very new nonprofit at that time. Uh, I was surprised when they said yes. So soon we managed to gather a few local folks uh, who were also poachers at that time. And uh, they later called themselves the Gang Duntung, like the real gang <laughs> terrapin guardians. So every year during the terrapin nesting season, uh, I would camp out at the riverbank with these terrapin guardians. And in the middle of the night when the whole kampung was asleep, we would be at the riverbank waiting for female terrapins to emerge and lay their eggs. And uh, unlike sea turtles that lay uh, an average of 100 eggs each time, our terrapins produce only about 25 to 35 eggs. So each egg is very precious to us. So when the female is done laying eggs, we will, or a terrapin guardian will carry her to the campsite uh, for us to weigh, measure, and microchip. 
and occasionally when we had some time in between processing these females, uh, we would chat and we would talk about the terrapins, their families and their children. So about five, four, five years into the project, uh, Pachewazi confided in me. He said that before he was involved in our terrapin conservation project, he felt like he was an outsider. He felt like he didn't belong in the village. But after doing this for a few years, people now refer to him as Waze Tuntung or Waze the Terrapin Guy. So this conservation project has not only given Pachi Waze a sense of identity, uh, it has also given him a sense of belonging in a, in a place where he had spent most of his adult life. Right, the next morning, we would bring these terrapin eggs from the riverbank back to the kampung for incubation. Uh, we cannot leave these eggs on the riverbank because of nest security. Uh, it was safer and a lot more economical to uh, bring these eggs back and incubate them in a hatchery, a fence up hatchery. And after about three months, uh, the hatchlings would emerge. So what I would do, I would record the hatching success of the eggs, like how many of them hatch. I would break open the unhatched eggs to see uh, why they, don't, they didn't hatch. And uh, then I would measure and weigh all the hatchlings. And then Pachi Waze would raise them at his home for a few months before we released the terrapins. So back when our, when our project was new, uh, it was very difficult to look for interns. So one day, I enlisted Pachi Waze's daughter, Nurul, to help me with data recording. And over time, I taught her to use a pair of digital calipers so that we could, both of us could measure the therapy so faster, right? And at the end of one month, I paid her 50 ringgit for her help and time. And she had tears in her eyes. She, she admitted that that was the first 50 ringgit that she had earned in her adult life. And then I thought, if our small conservation project could affect somebody so positively, surely it could one day have a larger impact on the local communities. So, when I packed my life belongings and drove to Chukai to lead this conservation project in 2011, I didn't know a single person in this town. Uh, and, and this being a new project, there wasn't much to do on weekends. So I put together a day tour and I called it the Turtle Discovery Trip. I would take guests on a tour and uh, we would, I, would, I would tell them uh, about sea turtles, terrapin, storises. Uh, I promoted the tours on social media, but uh, it didn't pick up right away. Facebook was less popular then. And uh, on those weekends when we had guests, I would request Nuru to help uh, purchase uh, some pisang goreng, banana fritters, kuropo and drinks for our guests. Through word of mouth and consistent posting on social media, uh, our tour started picking up speed. Uh, I started getting inquiries uh, almost every other weekend. And from the initial two person tours, we were now uh, hosting two families per weekend. And then from there, it became two cars and then it became two bus loads. So one day, Nuru asked me, uh, Mac, tak yalah Mac beli makanan dari luar. Uh, Nuru boleh masak, nak? So she asked me, uh, ma'am, you don't need to buy refreshments from outside. I can cook. Would you like that? Of course, I said yes. So from then onwards, I started catering from Nurul. Now, every Friday, I would call and let her know in advance uh, how many guests we would be expecting tomorrow. And then she would prepare fried noodles, gropok, cold drinks. Um, if we were hosting more kids than adults, then I would order a curry puffs, banana cakes, uh, and other local kueh. So each time our guests finished the food that was served, uh, it was like a vote of confidence for Nurul. And in just three years, she opened her own food stall by the main road in Kampung, and she became her own lady boss. So these days, she cooks for passers-by, including ice delivery guys, postmen, and the local Kampung folks. Now, we cannot be on the ground trying to conserve river terrapins without also educating the younger generation about the importance of doing so. So while children comprise 30% of the, 
of our local population. They are 100% of our future leaders, future scientists, future policy makers. That is also why we insist on hosting these educational programs despite the challenges in securing funding for these programs. People don't really give you money to play with kids. So to date, we have conducted more than 120 turtle camps and we have reached out to more than 15,000 students in the state of Trungganu. So just when I thought I was doing everything that I could to save river terrapins, another idea came to me. I have been in the field of conservation long enough to understand that for, for, for us to conserve a particular wildlife species, a few things need to happen. First, the will to protect the terrapins need to come from the local villages. As an outsider, there is only so much we can do. And secondly, despite being a turtle conservation organization, we cannot just work with turtles. We need to work with the people, the local people as well. So that brings us to our latest program, which was initiated in 2019. So I started a women empowerment program by organizing lotion making and a soap making uh, workshop for the women in the local communities. A total of about 35 women participated in both the workshops. Uh, besides these workshops, I've also started engaging a few women to produce uh, uh, straw pouches, uh, bandanas, uh, tote bags using our turtle motif batik fabric. But one evening, one of the women asked me, uh, Meg, Saya nak join, tapi saya tak ada mesin dan saya tak pandai. So she said, ma'am, I want to join the sewing group, uh, but I don't have uh, a sewing machine and, I, and I'm not skilled. So then it occurred to me that there may be other women in the kampung who wanted to join the sewing group, but uh, they were unable to because they didn't have the tools or the knowledge to do so. Since then, I have been on the lookout for potential sponsors who could be interested to collaborate with us. And as we kickstarted the program last year in July 2020, we recruited 20 women from the local communities. These women were given a sewing machine each, and they are also enrolled in an all expenses paid creative sewing classes, uh, which is currently still ongoing. And we continue to engage them by producing uh, our merchandise. Uh, last year, from July to December 2020, in a span of five years, um, they have collectively made and sold about 5,000 pieces of fabric masks. And just yesterday, I picked up these lanyards from the ladies. So I remember when I paid the ladies for the first time, uh, one of them, Gatno, she held the money in her hands, she kissed the bank notes, and then she said, Alhamdulillah, Rizuki Pertama Kak Noor. So that was the first time Kak Noor was paid for something that uh, she had done. Now here's a confession. When I stepped into the village for the first time, I was acutely aware that I was an outsider. I was of a different race, a different religion, a different gender. And I was concerned about how I or the project would be received by the local communities, the local people. But here's the thing. I was immensely humbled by how the local folks had accepted me like family. It's true that what got me into the kampong was the terrapins, but through listening and engaging with the local communities, it has opened up a host of opportunities uh, for empowering the local people as well. So we started with having five Caribbean guardians uh, protecting one riverbank in the Kemaman River in 2011. Now we have 15 Caribbean guardians protecting four riverbanks. Um, our community conservation, uh, community based conservation project has saved more than 6,000 Caribbean eggs from human consumption. And we have released close to 4,000 hatchlings into the river. Without this conservation project, none of this would have happened. 
In 2018, I was named the Commonwealth Point of Light for Malaysia for my contributions to freshwater turtle research and conservation. But let's not declare victory yet. There is so much more that needs to be done. We need all the help we can get. We need to conduct more research projects because tak kenal maka tak cinta, right? We need to intensify our conservation efforts because we don't have a lot of time left. The terrapins take 20 years to attain sexual maturity. So if we don't take action now, all the eggs will be consumed in one generation. By 2040, there will be nothing left to conserve. We need to continue educating our youth and providing them resources to make good decisions. And we need to continue empowering the local villagers because they are the backbone of our local economy. But most importantly, we need your support and involvement. We cannot do this ourselves. And with that, I thank you. Thank you, Pelf. I so admire your courage, how you moved to a new community 11 years ago with the sole intention to save the terrapins. But it's now clear that you not only save the terrapins, you have changed the lives of people like Pachet Wazel, Nurul, and Kat Nur for the better. Uh, to all three panelists, Julian, Afika, and Pelf, all your presentations prove that your work in nonprofits, which at a glance, people might just think, ah, oh, and just another word water non-profit, but you also elevated the local community by teaching them new skills and giving them income opportunities. So well done to you and the team. And uh, now we shall move on to the questions. So are you ready, Julian, Pelf, Afika? Uh, Pelf, you have got the first question. Uh, there's a question on how do you incentivize the gang Tung Tung for them to help? Right. And, and oh. also a quick note on the, the, the second question. How do you take part in the turtle discovery trip? <laughs> right, okay. I'll, get, I'll take the first question first. Um, yeah, I, I believe very strongly that nobody should work for free. So it is not fair for us to ask the local villagers to help us collect eggs and then not pay them, right? So um, right from the beginning, we asked them how much, because they were collecting these eggs for sale and for their own consumption. So from the beginning, I asked them, how much do you get per egg when you sell these eggs uh, to your friends? So then they told me five ringgit each. So I said, I'll pay five ringgit. So just don't send it to your friends, send it to me. <laughs> so then we incubated all these eggs. Yeah, but um, over time, uh, each time we organize activities, we uh, get their help, uh, we, we enlist their help to, to do work, uh, we will always uh, pay them for their time. So. We will always need to pay them. <laughs> oh, and the second question, sorry. Yes. Uh, we will open a uh, turtle discovery trip uh, soon because right now the state borders are still closed, right? So when the state borders are finally open, we would begin planning and then we would uh, announce this across our social media sites. You can check out our website and uh, you can sign up online. Okay, so to everyone listening in, sign up to the social media. Uh, you are on Twitter and Instagram, correct? Yes, and Facebook. Uh, and Facebook, yes. So do it now. <laughs> yeah, so, <laughs> so the second question is from Na Jensen. And um, this question asks, uh, what are the research areas that you could suggest that is able to benefit your conservation efforts and spread awareness about threats towards endemic or endangered species? using scientific knowledge and publications. So this is all for all three, Julian, Afika, and Pelf. Since Pelf answered the last one, uh, let's start with Julian, Afika, and then Pelf. Okay. Um, I think one of the things that's missing is a better understanding of um, some of the social issues that all three of us are dealing with. Um, there are lots of conflicts in resource management. Uh, Pelf wants to save turtles, but people want to eat the eggs. Um, having the scientific data on turtle populations is one side of the story, but persuading people of the need to retain those populations, you know, what is biodiversity, who knows, I don't. Um, and, and, and getting them to buy into it is, is a social issue. Uh, and I think we need to do more work on that. Certainly where we work, people question, well, why are you doing this? Well, you know, we can give them the science, but persuading them 
from a social perspective is, is more is more difficult. Thank you, uh, Afika. Okay, uh, due to these questions, actually our biodiversity needs needs your uh, your your expertise to do the research about what we actually have. Uh, actually, Malaysia have uh, reach of the biodiversity. So, uh, uh, because before this, we uh, our uh, advisor, which is uh, Ka, which is Ka, Ka N, have discovered a new species of the nudie branch. Yeah. So, uh, actually, uh, if you are in Johor, you can come to our area to do your to to maybe we can discuss what your expertise. And uh, I would like to uh, it's like to say some say the important things that if you do research at one place, you need to uh, emphasize the community there because uh, they they actually have more knowledge uh, about the locals about their habitats. So we you can uh, you can also combine your scientific knowledge and the locals knowledge to make this uh, research become more stronger. And don't forget to uh, to really uh, maybe credit the name to to who you work with with yeah this is really important because some uh, of some of our experience many research researchers come to us uh, to work for uh, for many kind of things but they did not credit us or uh, as part of their research so this is quite uh, really important for you because you are crazy so uh yeah if you enjoy you can come to us can we can talk more that's a very kind offer thank you afika and good tips there very practical real life tips thank you uh health you want to add on yes um so if you do a quick search on google scholar uh, you will find that there is a not a lot of uh, published papers on the river terrapin. So that just means that there is still uh, a lot of potential for research uh, projects. And off the top of my head, uh, population studies, population surveys, genetics, uh, feeding ecology, uh, besides what berembang, what else do they eat in the river, right? What else is available to them? Uh, their movements throughout the whole year, uh, nest site selection, how do they choose a, a river bank to lay their eggs in? On <laughs> how, how do they interact with the environment, uh, their ecological roles? So they are. Uh, it is a long list. Yeah. So if you're interested, uh, write to me or contact me. We'll discuss more. I didn't know you could research. Do so much research. <laughs> you learn something new every day. Okay. We have we have another question for all three panelists again. Uh, you probably face downside and difficulties along your journey and all your journey spent so many years, oh, more than a decade. How do you find the motivation to to renew renew and refresh and build up your courage again to continue the journey? Uh, so, Pelf, maybe you want to go first, then Julian, then Afrika. Okay. Uh, how do you find motivation? I, I draw motivation from people and things around me. Uh, well, I think being grateful for things that we already have is a must. You need to be grateful about what you already have. But, um, okay, for example, when we go to schools and play with kids, um, well, I've, I've had students who come to me, you know why I like to go to schools? Because they call me Kak Chen, so <laughs> I like to go to schools. <laughs> so then they, they, they come to me and then they say, Kak Chen, Kak Chen, saya tak nak makan telur penyu. So they say, Kak Chen, Kak Chen, I don't want to eat turtle eggs anymore. So that's just very heartwarming, right? And uh, the community empowerment program, I should have started work with working with the women, but then, you know, I just started doing it three years, two years ago. When I see um, how they appreciate uh, the efforts put in and how much their lives have changed since working with us, that gives me a sense of achievement. And, uh, and seeing these people empowered empowers me. So yeah, find motivation wherever you can. <laughs> We did some work with yeah. Sorry. We did some work with school kids in Tierman a few years ago, and and well, actually twelve years ago, and recently bumped into one of the kids who said, "I'm I'm still not eating turtle eggs." So, you know, school education does work. But I think I think I mean, look, lots of people live on a seesaw. You have ups and downs, and I think people like Pelf and myself and Afika have the same problems. Um, 
you get crazy situations like Tierman at the moment, Tierman Island at the moment, there's, there's moves by the state government to de-gazette the MPA. Yep. What, I mean, we're in an era where biodiversity conservation is becoming increasingly important, yet they want to move backwards. And at the same time, they're proposing a new airport for the island. How can you, how can we be even having that conversation? You just want to tear your hair out. And then you go out to the island and you talk to some of the local people there and you start to understand their views on it and you get support. You meet people who are empowered and, and so on. And so that gives you the up again. Um, I think a lot of what the negative stuff is from outside. It, the, the local stuff is, is the positive stuff. Working with the communities is, can, be very, can be very rewarding. Thank you, Gillian. Afika, are you ready? I can. Uh, yes, uh, we face a lot of difficulties, especially uh, due to uh, the financials. Uh, but yes, uh, me as a very young people, I cannot provide a million ringgit, but I would like to spend my whole day, my whole time to do something good to the, uh, something good to and benefit uh, to the community and for, for help the community. So uh, the motivation is uh, if I'm, I'm not doing this, this could not happen. So if we are totally give up, so this thing, this overall that we decided from 2008 will disappear like that. So that's why every day, it's like uh, we always motivate ourselves uh, we inspired ourselves by saying we need to do this for our community and also for ourselves uh, uh, to help to to have this uh, fisherman livelihood still uh, still known until the our new generation. So yes, and we, we would like to make sure that this new generation can feel what we feel now. We can. We can play with the seagrass, we can play in the mud, we can uh, walk in the mangroves. So this this kind of thing la, that make me to uh, motivate ourselves to do kind of this work. Yes. I like how all your answers, they all come back down to the community and the people that, that your work uh, centers around. So, so that is very telling. Uh, so it's not just life underwater that you could fight for and conserve, but it's also the people, which is equally as important. Uh, we have another question. Um, this is, uh, th this person is a law graduate, but she, she or he uh, ha have interest in environmental conservation, especially marine conservation, and always wanted to be a part of it. How can a legal practitioner take part in conservation efforts? So kind of marry the two two fields, law and also marine conservation. Is there a way for this person to, to do this? Well, from my perspective, I think we need laws strengthened in a number of areas that affect uh, conservation. Um, I mentioned the marine parks earlier on. There is no actual marine park law in Malaysia. Malaysia. Uh, there are five or six clauses in the Fisheries Act that define the, the, the authority of the Director General to establish marine parks, but it doesn't say how big they are, it doesn't say what the regulations will be, so it's not very well uh, defined. Uh, that's, just, that's just one area. Um, you know, the, li the rights and obligations of state versus federal, uh, you know, two, two nautical miles, three nautical miles of area protected. Uh, there's, a, there's a lot of grey areas. Um, I, I don't know about ter river terrapins, but turtles themselves have various jurisdictions are looking after them. So there's a lot of uh, lack of clarity on exactly who's responsible and exactly what the protection is uh, that needs some considerable work on, on uh, legal support. Yeah, I, I echo uh, Julian's uh, comment uh, and he, he was spot on that um, there are I shouldn't call it discrepancies, <laughs> um, but the, we, we have the Wildlife Conservation Act governing uh, uh, 
terrestrial uh, freshwater turtles and then we have uh, wildlife and then we have the fisheries at governing sea turtles until but, you get into the marine parks when they become the jurisdiction of the marine parks no, okay I, I haven't even gone there yet let's just we are just <laughs> at the estuary right now because there is one type of freshwater turtles the painted terrapins live in the river but nest on marine beaches this is very confusing at least to lawmakers so who are they under Department of Wildlife or Department of Fisheries. So yeah, uh, um, we would benefit from uh, uh, your services in the future uh, <laughs> if you are able to help clarify these things so that we, we then know uh, who to go to, uh, you know, what kind of permits to apply for if we want to do certain conservation work. You know? Yeah, that would be most helpful. Without clear boundaries, we are just being sent to run around the garden. Mm -hmm. Yes, uh, yeah, from my view, it's same with the Dr. Park and Julian. Actually, we need lawyer to make us uh, clear with the rules and laws about the environmental damage. So we will uh, do some actions uh, because uh, now we face with the problem that uh, most, of, most people or researchers come to our area just take uh, maybe a hundred thousand a hundred species of uh, of the marine marine fauna, eh, marine fauna so actually we have loss of our habitat so this, this can damage even though uh, uh even though it's still under researcher uh, observation but we need these uh, rules and regulation to make our uh, habitat sustain and we can keep this uh this special habitats because some of people come to us uh, they want they say they want to uh, protect this area but something uh, something uh, another thing that they need so for me uh, we really need the lawyer for the for the conservation mm -hmm. yeah okay thank you everyone um i think if if you, you don't have answers uh, to your questions, you'd like to know more, I'll just take a leave out of uh, Afika, what Afika said earlier about uh, asking. So come approach all, all three uh, uh, panellists here, you, you know them now and their stories, and then just, just drop them an, a, a note on social media and ask how you can help and, and to know more. right? So in all areas, whether it's research, whether it relates to the work that you do or or how your company can help, right? It's as easy as just dropping a note. Uh, so uh, we have one more question. Uh, Lilian would like to ask if tours to see turtle lay eggs on a beach, positive or negative for turtle conservation? I think uh, this is uh, for health. And then perhaps um, Julian, you'd like to take this question as well. Okay, um, first of all, uh, Turtle watching is illegal. <laughs> uh, there is no provision in the Fisheries Act 1985 that allows ecotourism to happen on sea turtle nesting beaches. But <laughs> um, I, I think there's this really fine line between uh, conservation and awareness. And um, I think that both parties, both sides can benefit from the conservation activities as well as awareness to the local public if... Uh, the public is allowed to watch turtles nest on on the marine beaches yeah but um it is generally a good idea it is highly educational you know you take your kids there and they learn about the ecology of the uh, sea turtles and the uh, nesting process but uh, when you it's, what is wrong is when you start flashing torch lights when you start touching the sea turtles when they are laying eggs so that's wrong right that's not not the right thing to do yeah so it's not a direct uh, Yes, no question to this, I guess. Mm. Yeah, it's, uh, it's a difficult one. Um, I, I think if it's non-invasive, which is what you were suggesting, Pelf, uh, and it's well controlled and managed, then okay. Uh, there are guidelines in various countries we've looked at. Uh, it should only be done at night during the natural nesting time. Uh, red light should be used. People shouldn't be allowed to get within certain distances of the, of the turtle. No flash photography. Um, and I'm sorry, but if you want a nice picture of a turtle laying an egg, then you're not going to get one. And that's, that's just life. Leave the turtle alone. 
Um, so uh, yes, so you bear, you weigh the, di the the disadvantages with the benefits, which is, as Pell says, it's very educational. So I'm it's the sort of thing that you would like to support as long as it's done uh, professionally, done well, and that you know the the, the rules and regulations are, are followed. Thank you. So, oh, we have one more question. Ah, okay. So, one last question before we end the session. Uh, yes, I just had a reminder, five more minutes left. Uh, this has been a very engaging session. Thank you for all the questions. So, final one. Can you, for all three panelists, can you please share something alive below water that you have seen, observed or felt recently that we can learn from today. So I'd like to also add to this because it is the final question. Um, so what can you learn? Uh, what have you observed that we can learn from today about life underwater? And also closing remarks about what you would like to, your final words for, for today's uh, participants, what you, you would like people to take away from this session, right? If anything else they don't remember, they remember your, this fi final few words, okay? So, uh, Julian, I'll let you to go first, then Talf, and then Afika. Cuttlefish. That's the most right? inspiring thing there is underwater, <laughs> cuttlefish thing. Kind of like squid, but not quite, not exactly the same. Okay. They change shape, they change color. They're like aliens from another planet trying to tell us something. They are pretty cool. Um, and I suppose the last word would be, listen to what we've all said. We need to understand how communities interact with these ecosystems uh, and we need to help them to change livelihoods or whatever. But there's also a much bigger picture here. How are we going to get big businesses to take these issues more seriously because there's only so much we can do on a local level to, about things like climate change. In fact, there's very little we can do about climate change. We're plugging holes. It takes the big businesses of the world to say, we will take climate change serious. We will take zero, zero carbon targets and so on. That's my two cents worth. Right. Thank you, Tal. Okay, um, I, I have seen a painted terrapin in the Charating River caught in a fishing line. So he was neither here nor there. He was, you know, there's this fishing line uh, hook in his mouth. And uh, if, if the local villagers didn't find this painted terrapin in time, it would have died. Yeah, due to fishing gears left in the river uh, for prolonged periods. And this just shows the importance of freshwater turtle um, conservation. It's, these are things that you don't see every day. Already you don't watch, uh, you, you don't see uh, documentaries on freshwater turtles because they are less famous, less well-known, uh, less sexy. So we need to highlight this and we don't have, like as mentioned just now, we don't have a lot of time. We need to highlight this. And um, my closing remarks would be, um, for, for all of you guys watching this today, um, consider working with local NGOs uh, because we, we work with the local communities. We are like the bridge, you know, that bridge you, your company to the people on the uh, grassroots level. Um, don't, don't do touch and go projects because it not only undermines our long-term effort, it is really not beneficial to anybody, right? So yeah, these this two points. Oh, and the other thing that you should also remember is uh, check us out on Facebook. <laughs> Thank okay. you, Pell. We'll remind everyone again later. Okay, uh, the, the things that I can see below water is a lot of, lot of main, lot of new things. Because uh, it's like uh, I just mentioned before, KN has uh, risk, uh, recovered the new species of the nudie branch. Actually, it's really small, and Kaen is uh, not researcher. He is a micro diver, so he can so his eyes is like microscope, so he can see a lot of very small tiny things. So uh, actually, we have a lot of uh, very special unique that we have never explored with before, and from uh, my uh, from my big view is. Uh, all of us are depending each other. We are depending on the habitat and uh, habitat is depend on us also. It's like 
uh, we have the island, we have seagrass, we have mangroves, and we have also have land. So every every uh, every singles of this is related each other. So we are uh, in the big scope. We need to gather to protect this area. And the, the most important things is uh, don't forget the local people that some that always <clears throat> people always ignore about them because uh, they got the knowledge from them and then they just not credit to them. So uh, please do do the the work with your clean heart and yes, please do uh, explore a lot of new things that uh, we have in Malaysia. After we explore in Malaysia, maybe we can go overseas. And yes, Malaysia, Malaysia is rich with the biodiversity. So we need to uh, explore in our area first. And yes, don't forget to follow our social media and do follow our uh, tourism and support us. Thank you. Yes, uh, I think it's very clear from all three presenters uh, to follow them on social media. So if you haven't done it already, do it now. Uh, it, I think uh, CGM has also retweeted them uh, and tagged them a number of times. So if you missed it, you can just go to Twitter, follow CGM, you'll see all the tags there. Yeah, so companies, it's time to get your act together to work with the local nonprofits to preserve our very rich biodiversity. Uh, and everyone here spread the word about river terrapins. Yeah, it's not well known compared to, to leatherbacks, right? Or green turtles. And thank you, Afika, for the reminder that everything and everyone is interconnected. Awesome reminder. So thanks for your time, everyone, uh, to the part Participants, you've been very engaging. Thank you for the great questions and for staying until the end. Uh, I hope you have benefited to the questions. Uh, to the panelists, thank you for all the work that you do. Uh, it's certainly a vocation. And um, all the prep that you've put into this, I know for a fact that you've re redone your slides so many times, right? You can you, you know it like the back of your hand already. Um, so it's evident that life underwater and the local community impact one another. And the, the work that all, all three panelists do is not just about saving the, the planet. It, it's so super important to ensure food security, to reduce the impact of flooding or drought. And we all need to pull our weight to limit our carbon emissions, whether as individuals or corporations. So check out their websites again and support the work that they do. Um, back to you, Sun Ho. Thank you, Florence. Yeah, thank you. Thank you to the panelists and thank you everyone who has been uh, watching this webinar. It is uh, evidently clear that uh, we all need to work together to, uh, it's not just about the life below water, but also the communities uh, on, the, on, on those respective uh, areas. So, um, and Climate Governance Malaysia, we, being an organization chiefly uh, comprising of members from the private sector is promoting such uh, events to you, so you are aware of them. So before we close uh, for this evening, uh, I'd like to point you to our next uh, event, which is a, a major one, a big one. It's going to happen between the 23rd and 26th of March. And please register for this event on uh, Climate Governance Malaysia's website. It is a big one. If you look at the names uh, on the shared screen, they are prominent names. And we will talk about uh, the climate subject in a uh, very, um, in, from a global perspective. So it will feature uh, the climate governance chapters from the countries all over the world. So until then, thank you very much and good night. Jumpa lagi. <laughs>